I'm Matt Matthew Woods, host of Leading Out of the Woods, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. The High Tech Podcast is back, folks. This is Josh, one of the hosts, if you haven't listened to us before, or you just you forgot my name. And I am joined by Will. Or if you forgot uh, your own name. Co-host. Yeah, in case you forgot your name. I some, it sometimes happens, you know? It's, uh, it's yeah, a little it's rough. Never happened. It's, it's it, a little rough. Okay. It's been a it's been a long week already. It's Tuesday. It's yeah, been a long week. It's only Tuesday. It feels like it should be not Tuesday and long and closer <laughs> to the end of the week already, but it is not. But we're super excited to be back recording. And some of you are like, guys, you never left. You've been here all along. We and know we do like, this every time. <laughs> yeah, but we haven't. Will has been uh off on the seas on an adventure. The, the seas. past two weeks, I don't know. I know you flew there, but you know you were in a different country, so I felt like it felt more epic to picture. I, it as like I, a pirate I trip. feel more epic now that I think yeah. about myself as a pirate. Yeah, but, basically a pirate. Alas, that's not what happened. Yeah, I was away. I uh, took a vacation. It was a great time. Belgium, Spain, flew all over the place. Loved it. Had much sangria. Uh, I recommend that in Spain. Do that. Uh, but now we're back. Only in Spain never never anywhere else no never you you can't even have sangria in your own home you have to Uh, have it in spain or bust you heard it here first in the high tech podcast folks (laughs) i had nothing else to add (laughs) i was like where are you going with that great i I didn't have have anything else to add cue us off my friend what do we need to know (laughs) what do we need to know um so uh yeah wow i'm a feel i feel so out of practice you know (laughs) Don't we, a a don't we, we have a Twitter? Don't we have an inbox? <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm gonna just to extend this as long as possible. Yeah, no, if you are listening to us and you're like, man, I really wish I could meet those guys online, you know, you can check out Will and I's dating profiles first. I'm just joking. What? That's <laughs> not true. Um, no, uh, yes. yes. Uh, anyway, uh, so you can actually check us out on more sane, normal places that two married people would be, which is Twitter um although that's this is this is taking real fast i don't know it's it's perfect it's fine it's anyway no perfect. seriously we're on we're on twitter at high tech podcast check us out there we'd love if you subscribe like some of our tweets you know engage with us yeah we know you're out there share folks. our episodes share our episodes somebody just did that last week which is super appreciative um especially if you like what we have to say if you don't like what we have to say you can share it too and be like these guys suck and it's fine because I believe no press is bad press. I don't know. I was. I feel like that's that is the saying. Actually, this yeah, is no saying? press is okay. bad press. Yes, I'm feeling well feeling great about this. Doing, Golf clap. Doing good. Uh, anyway, um, so you can also email us at inbox at hightechpod dot us. Uh, both of those places where you can send us our great animal picture that we ask for every episode, and this week I didn't plan ahead. You know? I want a parakeet on Ooh, a pie. A parakeet on a pie. That's yeah. good. There you go. Yeah. Preferably a fruit pie. I'll say I'll add a little. Not, feel a, like not a meat pie guy. No, I feel like. Well, no, I mean, I'm fine with that. But I feel like if a parakeet's going to like a pie, it's going to be a fruit pie. You know, maybe I'm wrong. Okay. I feel okay. like maybe I'm just making some judgmental statements about parakeets pie preferences. Yeah. But Wait, what are um, you, a parakeetist. Gosh. I I am. Uh, anyway, uh, after that, you can also check out our resources and stuff on our website. We have a website, hightechpod.us. Uh, it's great. It's a great website. You can go check it out. We have lots of resource pages there with uh, things about the tools that we talk about, um, fun pictures of the people that we have on the podcast. We talk uh, about tools? You know, we have people on we the do. podcast? We, we do both of those things. It's really great. Actually, I just saw a coworker who wanted to look something up on our podcast page real quick, and she brought up the podcast page. So it's pretty wow. cool. I love um, that. I'm not going to pretend like it's somebody that not all of you know. It was Robin. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> now met Robin. Um, because uh, what are we continuing this week, Will? 
the Robin S. Jeffers Learning Taxonomy Series. Da, 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 da. Da, da. <laughs> yeah, um, Robin is so excited this now. about this. No, she loves it. She's great. Apparently, did we make a joke about her having a heart attack in the first episode? Oops. She was like, apparently, <laughs> I had a heart attack, and I was like, I was like, wait, what? Because I don't. This is a regular. Robin will listen to this, so this is why it'll be funny. Uh, this is a regular interaction between Robin and I at the at uh, work on okay? Tuesdays. On Tuesdays, <laughs> um, she will say something about something we said in an episode because she listens to us, which is great. That's awesome. Um, Thank you. But I don't remember what we said. Like I barely even remember what we dropped that day. Like what episode went out that that's, day. That's the bigger <laughs> thing, right? Like we, yeah. we record these episodes and then they'll come out weeks or a month or two later. Like I don't remember. Yeah. I remember the tool because I have to right. make the page for the website, but I don't remember what we say. Cause you do the editing. So I don't, I don't really remember. So she'll say something and I'll be like, Oh, Oh, did we say, is that, oh, it's from an yeah, episode. Okay. Sure. I see what you say. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Um, and uh, so it's a regular laughable occurrence uh, on a Tuesday. That. So that was, uh, anyway, so we are in the Robin S. Jeffers Learning Taxonomy series. Um, side note, I hope you guys appreciate how I did the logo for this series because Robin S. Jeffers is super small at the top. You got to look carefully. Um, I really, so I really snuck it in there um, as I was, uh, dropping it in so we talked about this before robin inspired the series a little bit by her wanting us to talk about taxonomy as she was on for an episode um and surprise she may be coming back um you know we'll let you with a double feature Uh oh what 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 okay so uh but this episode we want to talk about all the different learning taxonomies out there we did kind of a broad episode with robin uh several episodes ago where we kind of just looked at a bunch of them and will and i were like you know this is a pretty rich topic there's a lot there there's a lot to talk about. So we wanted to dive into this a little bit more. Um, I think a good thing that happens on this podcast, I don't know about you, Will, but I feel like we dive into topics that we also don't know that much about sometimes only yes. because like, we feel like we want to know more about it. So we're like the podcast is our, is our audio <laughs> journal of us learning more. And not that you we know, don't know about taxonomies, we just don't know all of them. Like, and you and I have different ones that we know better than others. So this has been an interesting adventure yeah, yeah. so far. Each, each like, week it's been like... Hey, do you know something about this one? Yeah, I know this about this one. Okay, have you ever yeah. heard about this one? And then we just go back and forth until we know what we need to know yeah. for the episodes. Um, no, but like that's I like that you put point that out. Like this podcasting is an audio journal, like in many ways. Yeah. And so that's what we're we're digging into. We're not the experts. We're just kind of two guys who like to talk about things and hopefully Arm someone chair. Will find it fun. Yeah. So anyway, exactly. so this week we are diving into another one. Um, now, I will admit this is one that I know a little bit better than the others, only because uh, I think Robin and I referenced this in the episode she came in a couple weeks ago for um, she our team uses this taxonomy. So we're going to talk about Webb's depth of knowledge um, taxonomy today. Um, and my team uses that. Now, I will say my team, I've clarified several times in this podcast. I'm not actually an instructional designer on our team. I have I'm kind of <laughs> like an adjacent designer and i've done work um on that but i mostly oversee our instructional technology side of the the area but i do do teaching as well so um my knowledge of web's depth is kind of probably more shallow than the rest of our designers on the team uh like robin would be probably much better talking through web's depth than my would be but i find web's depth interesting why and I have, isn't she here i'm joking i don't know um but i have used it in design that's what we use web's right. depth to define right. depth of knowledge throughout our design of courses and the courses i've helped design we use that and it's pretty integrated into our system. Um, yeah. So I have a pretty good idea of what you know it as well. Will. so what's your background with it? Uh, in my master's degree, we had to do a couple studies on the learning taxonomies or, or like we had to build things according to different taxonomies and they apply them into the assessments assignments. So webs was one of the ones that we integrated. Um, so even that though is pretty surface level. I think that it's, I think it's one of these taxonomies that is, more helpful because it's less specific ironically mm -hmm. you know like there are there are wheels and you can get the same kind of verb lists as the others but um blooms has what six seven layers and each layer has like two or three points to it and and some of the other ones that we've dig in, dug into so far like there's a lot of information about this i like that levels one through four of of the depths of knowledge is is really kind of a broad space for you all together in the first place like we want you to think about it at this level we want you to move to this level we want you to get to that level um, but you can 
it doesn't have to be linear. You can apply it just level four stuff. You can apply it just level two stuff. You don't have to have everything build that way. Um, but it's not like a pyramid. It's not a circle. You know, it's like one, two, three, four. What do you got from there? Yeah, I, I like yeah, that about no, this one. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, for those who don't know Webs well, that's kind of the the way we define it and, and the way they define it themselves. We didn't just like come up with this on our own. Um, it's not uh, as we'll put it. They have levels right so depth of knowledge or dok is often what people reference it as um and there's four different levels there they define it as kind of re recall and reproduction level two skills and concepts level three strategic thinking and then level four extended thinking right um so those are the four levels but unlike blooms uh web's depth will say while there's kind of a leveling to it it's not uh a hierarchy it doesn't mean you have to do level one before you get to level two right or those types of things it's just kind of using it and the way our team uses it is kind of identify kind of the depths of what we're asking them to like the depths of knowledge we're trying to build and the the level in which we're doing in there so like a, a designer is going to aim to try to maybe not to get too crazy in like level four stuff pretty early um or is also going to try to vary week to week what they're doing so that they're you're not hitting them with heavy stuff all the time like that's that's kind of like the kind of vague way that our team uses it i feel like uh, in many ways yeah. um yeah. and also to make sure that you're not just sitting at a shallow level of knowledge like you're not just there having them recall information but you're having them think deeper about uh, a topic or that's uh, learning that's stuff. definitely a, a consistent i wouldn't say problem but definitely a consistent like consideration with the uh the learning taxonomies right like Almost all of them have some sort of level one or recall or, you know, factual knowledge stage, which makes sense. We all need to kind of get information before we can act on information in, in some levels. Um, but it's funny to me that they all have recall, you know, like level one is always about yeah. remembering something. Can they get the facts down? Can they get to find a concept? Can you recognize a pattern? Well, that's cool. But, you know, it. it <laughs> I don't think that that's always in all learning the first step that can happen. You know, it's almost always level one or the small, the bottom of the pyramid. But I know I've, I've in teaching like martial arts and certain things like that. I know I've like made students do stuff before they don't understand what's happening or before they even know what they're doing. It's like, Hey, follow me. Like, like, uh, even mime after me, like they don't know what they're physically doing in the motions or the, the techniques or whatever, like martial arts, but they're, just doing the physical action of it like me to kind of get that first practice and stuff. So, you know, to me as a, at a physical level, that's like, that's not recall. Maybe, maybe it's reproduction because they're reproducing what I'm doing, say, but like, I, yeah, a webs person might push back and say, well, you're helping them recognize patterns, right? Like you're, you're starting to get them to muscle, like, like in yeah, martial arts, yeah. like muscle memory of different techniques and things over like that. time. Like, yeah. I guess they're building time, that pattern. Yeah. yeah. So like, let me, let me ask you a question. Okay. Let's, let's dig into this idea a little bit because I will also say this. I'm not arguing with you because I do no, agree no, no. that like yeah, yeah. almost every taxonomy has recall in there. And I will just give my hot take for one second before I ask my question, which is that okay. there's a little part of me that thinks in every educational philosophy, there's like a soapbox that education has. Um, <laughs> they, that, no. they fit, that they fit in there. And I feel like in taxonomies, Never. most of it was just like, we don't like when you ask them to remember information only. You know, yep. and so recall yep. just made it everywhere at level one. They're like, that's the sad level. Okay, that's my hot take. <laughs> uh, my question, though, is right. Like, I did martial arts, too. Not nearly as much as Will did and not nearly as good at it and did not keep up with it. If you see both of us together, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um, but <laughs> uh, so but like, I remember this. Right. So like, OK, would you ever ask like a beginning student? Right. To just like step up into a fight. Um and uh start trying to do techniques right like or a full kata would you like you right, ask him right, to do right, like no, a full yeah. kata day one uh, you know they, other than to show them how much they don't know like that's sometimes. the only right, exactly <laughs> exactly sometimes you, and this is where i think audience analysis in instructional design is always so important right like if you do have okay i'm sorry i'm just gonna be i'm just gonna be flat honest with you if you've got that cocky kid who comes in and says, yeah. I can do this. Sometimes you need to show them that they can't. 
And so yeah. you give them the impossible task, right? Like, I, like yeah. I, not being mean, it's not malicious, but I have, yes, had kids like, all right, I, I can do martial arts. I've watched this or my brother taught me, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, let's, let's, let's get in the ring then. Like, show me what you know. And um, they can't. So, <laughs> so that's probably it. That's but that can't like that can't apply to every student. You're not going to do that in the broader yeah. approach. Like, it's just the, like, have the you exception. ever done surgery before? Come in here. I got this guy who's about to. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is big enough. No, and, and like, hey, have you, ever, have you ever cut a steak? Yeah, then you can you can do surgery. <laughs> even in that situation, that's what we've talked about about creating dissonance and things like that. But I would argue that even there, you're creating dissonance. To help eventually with the recall and reproduction, which is that you're helping motivate them in that situation and to show them. That I hate it when you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> I wanted to be, I was trying to be edgy and be buck edgy, against the system. I know. No, I, I mean, you're, you're right. Like at some level, even those things where you're trying to like give the dissonance or, or challenge the students in this first day is a technique to start building the foundations for what they don't know and help them yeah. take those steps towards the stuff that they're supposed to be learning. You're you're you. Yeah. Yeah. I think, Dang and it. that's maybe why, like as much as I want to do the soapbox thing, which I still think is a thing. I do think there is something you're identifying in a lot of the taxonomies where like recall of some sort is a part of it. And it's usually on the lower level. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that that is a base part of knowledge. Like I think most of us can argue that in most of our fields, there is something they have to, to try to like recognize or like a pat like yeah. i want them to see something now i'm teaching yeah. people how to interpret scripture and i'm working through stuff like that right and that involves sentence structure and things like those sort of patterns i want them to get to recognize as well um i think the point of what a lot of these people are doing then why it branches off in different areas is it seems to be in classic fashion of human nature we all agree about what the base thing is okay we all <laughs> were like that's the basics okay and then we all act like we really know things a lot better than other people. And all of our taxonomies venture off from there. And it, that's right. why, because I think if we're being honest, something, I'm, this is all clicking for me right now. All the taxonomies are showing me something, which is that for human beings, recall and reproductions at a lower level, because it's the easiest thing to right. teach someone and learn. And we know yeah. that it's a part of learning when we get beyond that is where it starts to get more complicated. Like, okay, how do we get people beyond that stage? Right. Like even the most basic teacher who has not had experience, I speak for myself and some of those experiences um, <laughs> can come in and say, I'm going to get you to recognize these terms from this area. Right. And we know that that's at least part of it. But then we acknowledge that there's something beyond that to actually like real complex learning um, yeah. that is hard to do. And that's why why we have so many different taxonomies because <laughs> they're all Ironically, trying to figure out those next stages. I'm going to instructional design us again here. If we backwards design the backwards design process, <laughs> maybe we're going forwards at this point, right? Two backs is a straight. I don't know. Um, when I'm trying to think through like the chunking of a course, when I did my first college course where I taught linguistics, um, I wanted to understand the broad categories that you can study in linguistics, morphology, phonology, phrenology, uh, semantics like you know what i mean i had to find those big categories and those were those knowledge centers that i then had to dig further into like what in morphology do i need the students to understand what in syntax is important for them to understand in context of mor morphology you know like i had to dig that apart and i had to drill down into the information it was about the data the patterns the the, the just facts and from there then i could organize the course and did have to go through with the challenge of like, okay, now that I have all the things in place, all the stuff they have to learn, how do I want them to start learning it? You know, I could just yeah. leave them a list of terms and glossary and have them read the book. But at the end of the day, I needed them to do that and see it in application. And, and I think what's, what's even cool for me looking at that depths of knowledge and thinking about that course that I designed and taught the audience for my linguistics course was not students going to be linguistics majors. The audience for my linguistics course were students who were going to teach English as a second language. And so through all the, the techniques and the information I taught them, it was trying to help them understand it in context of what it would be like to teach someone, right? So I didn't necessarily need them to understand 
semantics so that they could do debates on like etymologies of words, right? Like they they didn't have to understand the the understand like bleh, just lost myself in that. They didn't have to understand semantics to be like philo- philosophical about it. They had to understand yeah. semantics so that if they had an issue with a student who couldn't understand a word, how could they help that student? learn the meaning some different way you know what i mean like that's that was that yeah. and yeah. that plays into <clears throat> level two skills and concepts level three you know strategic thinking like i was trying to build that uh up for them and i i wasn't even using web depths of knowledge at that day like i wasn't yeah. thinking in in those terms when i was building that yeah. course well and i will say that's one like coming back to webs one thing i do like about webs is i do like that it captures some of that depth of knowledge that blooms has but it doesn't lock you into saying it has to start here and then move here that it's a little bit more of kind of a cyclical manner. It depends sure. on how you're doing things. There's different things that a student may need to learn or do with the knowledge that they have that it, it is at different levels. Right. So I like some of that, that it shows kind of that concept that like some of it is like, okay, I'm going to teach them some of these basic concepts, but then these students also need to know how to kind of like, okay, well, how do I get them to, you know, use that information? How do I get them to solve some problems of that? How do I get them to actually, strategic thinking level three this idea of actually like looking at complex issues um and trying to based on the knowledge that they have like actually trying to come up with strategies for dealing with those situations and things like that like in the example that you're you're talking about you're building this idea of kind of recalling the uh different terms within your class because i can't think of the word right now you just said it yep Uh, semantics morphology any of those there we go one of those (laughs) Um, and, uh, so pulling that up and saying, okay, well, they need to know this. They need to be able to eventually identify, like, I need to be able to give them the term or definition and they need to be able to reproduce that or identify that. But then I also right. needed to take that and like identify, like, I'm going to give them a problem and they need to be able to identify what type of situation it is. But then on yeah. top of that, I'm going to try to then eventually get them beyond that to think, okay, how can, uh, this might be where I bring in, like, you've got a student who, is having this issue you know which which of these kind of can you use and how do you use them to kind of solve that problem like beyond just identifying that this problem ties to this level three and webs is saying okay we're taking it one step farther though this problem ties to this now also how do you solve it using this you know like how do you how do you work through this issue or how do you so that's that's where they start to see it and i think what webs works well for again is also in places like when we're talking especially I think the advantage of webs is it does seem to work pretty well when we're talking like skills based stuff. Um, yeah. Because it starts to kind of get beyond that. But it also fits a little bit in spaces like more humanities courses. Like, man, I'm, I'm teaching terms of, uh, you know, different, like you said, different philosophies. Like, I don't want to just teach you these philosophies so you can be philosophical about it. I want you to be able to eventually like apply it, understand apply them it, to things, use like it. deal with those. Yeah, and and then extended thinking is level four, which is kind of this idea of getting to actually making things, designing. This would be yeah. where philosophy, I might actually have them start taking these philosophies and then actually come like write their own kind of take on something, you know, and yeah. have all those philosophies come in and start to influence the way that they write something or the way that they do something, well, right? And, and even in thinking back to my course, like that, that, more that uh, linguistics course i would definitely say that i probably followed the levels hierarchically but not linearly like not every single week was one two three four yeah i think i'm I'm recalling the course like i think f- weeks five through six was like a flip-flop between levels one and two like each week was doing like because none of my students had done any linguistics before so they needed all of the foundational information right so yeah. there was a lot of level one to to tell them what is morphology what does that mean what is semantics what does that mean but at the same time then i wanted them to extend that and be able to understand that in the concept of teaching english right every week there was this balance between level one level two of just the facts but also all right how does this apply or what are the problems that are going to be involved with with understanding morphology right in in language morphology sorry folks here's a quick linguist linguistics lesson um, is about the structure and design of words. The words themselves, those are morphemes, like there's shapes within those that become the words. That's what that study is. Well, for, for English teachers, it's important to know how your words are made so you can find the roots of words and suffixes, prefixes. But then you also need to understand your target language. Like if you're teaching students in 
a, a German speaking context, you need to know that they don't have just prefixes and suffixes, but affixes and, and they can use all three of those. Right. And like mm -hmm. these are the things that the students were trying to dig into and not only week to week get level one, like, oh, there are prefixes, there are suffixes, there are affixes. But why is that relevant to me as an English language teacher? Then I know like, you know, weeks uh, seven to 10 or so really dug them into strategic thinking, like what would it be like to build lessons around these? How are you going to do this yourself? Giving them, giving them problems, forcing them to solve it and digging into what it is. And then the end of my course was exclusively level four. They taught like uh, probably weeks 12, 13, 12 to like 15 or 16. Um, they taught lessons on those different areas and and extended it. So my course flowed level one to four, but you know what I mean? It wasn't like every week was one, two, three, four or something like that. It was, I think, really natural to give them the base information, have them wrestle with it and then synthesize and extend it. I really yeah. liked that. And I can probably fit that into most of the other um, taxonomies as well, but you know, like I was saying, but at the beginning of this, depths of knowledge is pretty straightforward. Like that, I didn't have to get into the the actual depths of knowledge wheel to see each of the verbs to understand. Like, huh, yeah. did I really use that in weeks one, two, three, or what was I doing in week seven? Like, it makes sense just from yeah. the the broad spro broad approach. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the advantage too of that, like the not hierarchical part, is that it does. I think Webs would acknowledge that. Like you need some an intermixing of the levels to also even help the other levels out. Like being able to uh, challenge your students into like level two stuff and strategic thinking also helps them better recall and reproduce stuff. Like at the right. end of the day, because they're using the concepts. So I think that's the advantage of that. Um, I will say the real quick the you know not to speak perfectly great of webs. I think webs disadvantages a lot of our disadvantages of taxonomies, but. I'll just say this. Let's just be real. Um, webs, some of the way it defines, like, especially three and four. I'm always kind of like. What's the okay, difference? I feel like there's a minor difference here between what you're talking about. Um, yeah. And I, I just that the webs part, I think sometimes is the same. It sometimes has the disadvantage that sometimes blooms does as well, which is like it's giving us these four categories but it's, it's can be murky between those four it's not like a clear cutoff in my opinion well they um, weren't baptists so they couldn't stop at three you know they needed to yeah keep going. well they had to do four yeah clearly uh so yeah i don't know that's kind of my with webs that's kind of my feel too where it's like eh like i feel like level one super clear then you start to get up to two, three, and four, and I'm like, okay, see, I'm not sure there's as hard a line as you think there is between <laughs> some of these things, okay? And especially because I think, like, it's also, this is maybe what I'm trying to get at, too. I feel like sometimes we try to classify things as, like, level two, depth of knowledge, level three, but it's like, well, hold on, this thing kind of, like, asks is a them two, to three? do three, four, like, you know, yeah, like, there's, yeah, yeah. like, there's a development to what we're doing here. Um, right. The, like, well, and that's where yeah. these things never work. Like, like I, I think I said in the first episode of this or, or with the Robin conversation before we started the series, at the end of the day, some of these things help us in the designing stage, but are probably only most effective in like the revision research stage, right? Like yeah. when I'm designing a course, I'm supposed to assign each of my levels to each activity or each unit or whatever. So we understand what people are doing and we can measure that the students have done their level two concepts or whatever. I, you know, is it really going to work? Is Are the students going to care or see it in action? Probably not. But if yeah. we do have those things in place, like there is the opportunity to research it after the fact. And that I think is a space where like these things need to be refined after we've done the courses. Yeah. Like like these things definitely need to be put through the ringer. At, not just not just webs, right? Like each of these taxonomies could really um if we're being honest, probably change if we did real research on, you know a hundred courses of application. Yeah. But the irony is there's, there's very few colleges, universities that are using it that consistently that you could use, that you could do this oh, yeah, research absolutely. on a hundred courses. This is, yeah. This is uh, definitely one of those things where it's like, this gets thought of at the beginning a lot, but let's be honest. When we start to like get into the like nitty gritty of design, 
I don't know. Yeah. Like, and so, and I would just, in case you're curious, just fun fact, because I was trying to remember this. I was like, when I was talking about, there's like a murky line between like two and three or like three and four. I was like, wait a second. Yeah. Doesn't our system allow for two depths of knowledge choices uh, in our, in our office? It's so like, just pull back the curtain for a second. Okay. We have, uh, Will knows this. We have something in our design process that not all the designers love and that's fine. I don't care. Um, it's <laughs> called, it's, it's called, uh, we call it for short, the CHA sheet, okay? Uh, it's called, which stands for Configuration Hours and Assessments Sheet. I know everybody's super excited. I can tell. Like, Will's so super, great. super awake. <laughs> uh, you would like this, though. Okay, so um, we have a system we design our courses. We design in Notion. Of course. Um, first, because we like to do collaborative document work and things like that. Um, but we have in that, it's a giant, like, integrated table that lays out all of the settings for every activity in canvas. Like we use canvas, um, but also integrated into that is a tool that calculates up like our hours evaluation for activities and things like that. But there's a, there's a DOK dropdown and the options are one, one and two, two, two and three, three, three and four, four. So just in case you're curious, <laughs> we also combine them uh because i think we acknowledge because it's, not it's quite as practical a hard yes um but that's actually where we track that we'll track all dok's for every activity in uh, wow. that sheet um so wow. anyway uh so i think the only thing we haven't really touched on in the full thing was like just a little bit of the language right like opening up yeah. a you know a level wheel um you know some Which examples of them that their chart is not a pyramid that's all i'm saying <laughs> yeah right okay <laughs> We, we, it reminds me of uh what was that what's that game the the colors game simon like just, oh you hit the colors oh, yeah, yeah you did the little buttons and it went yeah yeah, yeah. i think it was like a simon sit there and see how far version. you could do the memory game yeah, yeah exactly yeah that's what it looks like folks um <laughs> so under level one though i really like that they provide a couple of sample uh statements yeah. like you don't have to go look for somebody's sample somewhere but um Level one activities like recall elements and details of a story structure, such as sequence of events, character, plot and setting or label locations on a map uh, represent words in diagrams. Or what represent in words or diagrams, a scientific concept or a relationship like, OK, cool. I like those examples. That's pretty easy to understand for level one. And they have examples of that for levels two, three and four. Uh, but level one, we see language like recognize, use, quote, match, label. That's Bloom's number one, right? Uh, level two, we've got a bunch. Graph, classify, infer, distinguish, interpret. Okay. When I think interpret, though, I'm already starting to think, like you said, like, isn't that kind of strategic thinking? Um, but you come down to strategic thinking, and it's like develop a logical argument. I like that. They they yeah. were not scared to make it a statement as opposed to just single yeah. word. Uh, apprise, revise, explain phenomena yeah. in terms of concepts. Like, okay, that's cool. Yeah. And then it almost feels like level four that gave up. It's just like, <laughs> there's like six words. Well, like, okay, yeah, like I, you know, I feel like that's, it is true. When you look at the chart, level four, it's like, whoa, what happened to level four? Did somebody get lazy? <laughs> we, we ran out of phrases. Um, Literally, no, folks, level is... one's got like 20, level two's <laughs> yeah. got like 25, th you know, three's got true. 15. And and level four has uh, ten. <laughs> so we have a we have a running joke in our office. Okay, not a, not about this, but I'm going to give context so this makes sense, so I can make the joke. Okay, <laughs> love, um, it, love it. I'm sorry, Canvas, if you're listening. Uh, but I don't know about anybody else who's used Canvas, but I hate Canvas's rubric system. Like it's yes. it's a nightmare to use. It doesn't yes. there's things that don't make sense. Um, Every the way time. That things <laughs> copy over are weird sometimes. So we when we adopted Canvas from the very beginning we're like we started blaming everything on the guy we now call rubric guy like we're convinced <laughs> that in canvas there's like a cousin of like the owner of canvas who like they had to bring in and they're like you just you do rubrics so right, you do right. and uh, the reason oh, I bring we that have up to is hire I'm, this guy <laughs> yeah I, i'm bringing this up because i'm pretty convinced whoever came up with web's depth of knowledge also hired rubric guy because in our theory in our meta at work he he goes to different jobs. He's been other places. Um, and uh, Rupert Guy went to Webb's Depth of Knowledge and was like, don't worry, guys. I'll take level four, you know? Yeah, like exactly. Some, I, somebody I got asked, this. Somebody like really like the overachiever took level three and they like sat down in a meeting and that guy was like, okay, here are my words. Develop a logical argument. Okay, okay. 
Rupert guy, what do you got for level four? I got design. Create. <laughs> Maybe uh, proof. That's all he's got. Anyway, to, to his defense, though, I do think the reason level four maybe is a little bit different is because they start to get into like some bigger ideas in the creative thinking um, to their defense. Like design has a lot to it, I would say. Um, I don't know. I would agree, though. We're missing a lot of things. I will say that is one of the things I like about Depths of Web of Knowledge, though, that also Blooms does a little bit. I will say writing SLOs, super easy in Depths of Knowledge. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I will say I like their words. I think their words do help give like I remember writing we use Web's depth to actually even write like learning goals for a training course uh, on something. And I remember like okay. I feel like it helped me better kind of, kind of better solidify things I needed the students to do. Like it was like, OK, I can't just teach them the concepts about the interface that they're using. Like I actually have to at some point ask them maybe to give them a problem that they have to solve and identify where they would go to solve that problem. Like, so like, and that actually helped. I think it helped in training right. the students. So I will say that that was helpful. Anyway, there you go. Yeah, that's the yeah. wheel. And that's steps of knowledge. And I feel like we've gotten deep enough, you know, deep enough oh. into, into the abyss that is web's depth of knowledge, you know? And uh, now we need to come out of those depths into, well, frankly, I'm... we need to build our own new depths, our own depths of knowledge. That's true. With your personal research assistant. There's a lot Zotero. of knowledge out there. Well, how do we organize it? You know, that's, Zotero. That's do, 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 do. Um, I was actually trying to figure out how to make that transition. I was like, Zotero, you well, have a crappy like, name. I need a better name exact... to transition. <laughs> I was thinking like esoteric. No, it was like Socrat. No, there's there's no like, there's uh... no good joke. I was about to go. I need I need an assistant to help with this transition. And then uh, <laughs> um, start to get out of that direction. Zotero is a tool much like Mendeley. We've done an episode on Mendeley before. They're kind of competitors, but you know, they, they've it's both fine. got some we, pros we and cons. Like the competition. They make themselves better by being competitive, so keep it up. That's um, the idea. Yep. Uh <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> zotero is a research assistant is a bibliography tool um you can use it to organize all of your research um i actually was a part of a conversation with a bunch of colleagues recently where um somebody was reaching out like hey i just got an ipad i'm trying to get all my details together and my research and i want to be able to take annotations and notes and stuff and so like literally a whole <laughs> five or six people showed up in this conversation like oh i love one note <laughs> <laughs> ah, oh there's always love, one guy there's, can we just talk about that for a second there's always yeah. and justin if you ever listen to this episode i know it's you you are one of those guys <laughs> there is always that one guy who's like have you seen one note but like, have you heard of this cool thing called yeah no it's great um, it'll be fine i do i do like one note for um it's it's handwriting stuff like for and after that, I'm out. Um, yeah. So, and, you know, and like, it's not as searchable, whatever. Sorry. This isn't an anti this one note episode an yet. Uh, this is a Zotero <laughs> episode. Um, so if you need something that's going to let you upload your research articles, upload PDFs, upload, and upload any of your media that is um, searchable, that is part of your research corpus right this is your one-stop shop they provide a pro platform for mac windows linux and ios unfortunately notice there is no android i will say mendeley's got an android app but um zotero is available <laughs> on all those platforms and will sync any of your your resources across them right so you can log in on your phone download a thing to it and then go to your desktop later and and be able to use that same article there um, it offers a lot of citation tools. It syncs. You can collaborate with others. Like I could invite Josh to work on something with me on it. You know, look at look at my notations and stuff like that. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward. I just I love these kinds of tools, right? Yeah. The idea is you've got research and instead of just keeping it in a file folder or printing it all, <laughs> please, please don't print it. Um, Zotero keeps it digitally for you. Then you can search it. You can tag them. You, you know, 
it's pretty good at pulling your own data out of it. So if, if it's got the metadata on it, you upload the file and it'll start to fill in. It's a journal type journal article with this author and this editor and this, you know, volume page, all that kind of stuff. Um, sometimes any of the best of these tools can still get messy with that metadata, but uh, you can always fix it if it's yeah. wrong. So I will say in general, well, a positive in Zotero, I've heard from people who use it that, and I used it a long time ago, but I like, I do feel like they've done maybe they're a tiny bit better with the tagging, like auto tagging and stuff like there's, yeah, they, they've been doing that a little bit longer. So like from some of the competitors, cause like, listen, Will and I will, will be a hundred percent honest, even in this episode. Okay. If we were in a room and we had to pick Mendeley and Zotero and we had a free choice. It was Mendeley. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be honest. Both of him and I would probably pick Mendeley. But we both, we, well, and we both use it. I still yes. use Mendeley. You use Mendeley. Like uh, that's yeah. our every day, but it's good to know there yeah. are options. There are options out there. And I know plenty of people who really like Zotero, which is kind of why we wanted to share it. I think it's another right. alternative that and, can and be in helpful that, and does some stuff that Mendeley doesn't. Like both of them kind of do some things that each one does not. Right. Um, In that context of that, that group, that professional group I was talking about, that, that person chose Zotero. So like they were actually strong leading with one note, ironically, and they ended up on Zotero, which is awesome. So I think that like, you know, people who give a sh good shot of things, um, will be able to, you know, figure it out for themselves. Yeah. And, and, and here's an easy one, right? If you were Android only kind of person, then, then Zotero is not for you, but a lot of folks are iOS and like this person I was talking to, yeah. she had a new iPad that she was trying to get all of her stuff on so she could take notes and, and take it with her to conferences and things like that. So Tara is perfect. It'll, it'll get that done yeah. for you. They also I have Zotero. Oh, go ahead. Good. I wasn't sure who should continue, frankly. No, um, oh, yeah. they have Zotero Bib. It's a separate app, but it's like a oh, yeah, specific yeah. bibliography tool that'll yeah. really help you create your bibliographies. Like who doesn't want something that makes that easier? Yeah. And I've heard a lot of people who like that. Uh, new kind of it's a i think it's still in beta um but uh it's they, they have it like free and open uh, yeah. for people and people have been liking it so um all i was gonna say is that i like out of the friends who i have that use otero they're definitely more apple users and i and i do think that is a preference i think uh a lot of apple users prefer otero because of the way it integrates with their stuff um, yeah. a little bit over and that's will and i are not apple people if we've not made that clear in the podcast up to this point so that's probably why but i know plenty you have of an iphone like but i do but I that's out of you. like family choices it's fine you know oh, sure, i sure, don't sure. i had to use my co-workers mac today to do something and it was it hurt me a little bit on the inside you know like i just it was it was it was bad um anyway Ew. oh yeah. yeah i know it's gross anyway <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's a terror school. Just go check them out. Uh, they're free. You can download their app. You can start yeah. uploading PDFs, resources in there. Um, I highly recommend doing getting a tool like this, either Zotero, Mendeley, any of the ones that kind of fit in that group. Don't do OneNote, okay? Let's just be very clear before I end this podcast episode that <laughs> you shouldn't do that. Like, like, let's just go back to the example real quick. Will and I are in a room. I don't know why there's some crazy people trying to get us pick it, or apps or they'll kill yeah, us. I don't yeah. know. That's and, what and I'm why in this, this is, scenario. Yeah. But like if somebody was holding Zotero and holding Mendeley and they were also like, here's one note and you either pick one note or you don't live. I'm going to be honest. I probably still wouldn't pick one note. Like, like what's, wow. what's a life with one note? <laughs> this is a real question um so anyway that's the that's the plug go check out zotero zotero.org uh and uh download their app check it out start organizing your research yeah um and if anybody was curious we... our mendeley episode was episode 16 so if you want well to hear done. our breakdown of that you can also go check that out on episode 16 well done yeah that's a throwback holy crap it was we did mendeley quite a while 74. ago 74 love yeah. that that was when we talked about uh, how to find good apps that was that was a good episode well i mean we had a good app to to offer so we clearly did. it yeah. was easy yeah. we are at an it close folks thank you for another week uh joining us we as always want to encourage you to find us on twitter at high tech podcast um if you are interested of course in communicating the pictures and things like that you can send them to inbox at high tech pod we have a website high tech pod dot us or dot us, us if you're josh no nope. um, if you're the rest you of the world it's not us <laughs> we love that you participate in all that stuff with us next episode episode 75 we are gonna dig into scroll to the left kirkpatrick's 
Kirkpatrick's is a, um, a learning taxonomy that's used very frequently in, in corporate. It's been a part of all of my corporate job interviews, ironically. Really? Um, and so, I, yeah, it's what's you know, like, do you know this? I'm like, yes, I know that. Um, so we'll dig into that one. And then a favorite that we actually kind of cameoed in episode 49, but didn't really. We're going to yeah. dig into the app Zencaster in 75. We use this and we're using it even tonight. We use it pretty frequently. We use it for all of our interviews. Love this tool. Looking forward to talking about that in episode 75. Until then, as always, thank you for joining us for another week. We hope that you'll continue to learn what it looks like to uh, harness technology in the classroom, whether it's online or in person. Until next week, see ya. See ya. See ya.